Got it. Our, got it. Here we go. Um, we're going to go live here on, um, what do you call it, on YouTube at the same time as we're recording this. So um, awesome. we'll address some of these topics right now what we're going to be talking about is fasting and um you know the benefits of fasting and all kinds of good stuff here so questions about fasting and i think the big thing is uh, your people are too hungry all the time to fast do you, if you have hypoglycemia or they're worried about hypoglycemia and should they fast with hypoglycemia and then the other thing that i often see often is the question of like, if I have adrenal fatigue, should I fast, right? There's that issue too. And how often should you eat in general? What about intermittent fasting versus prolonged fast? And mm -hmm. what can I eat during fast? And that always cr cracks me up because <laughs> like, wait, we're not Nothing. Be eating during <laughs> fasting. That's the point of fasting. Right. But yet there are, you know, fasting mimicking diets uh -huh. and yeah, you know, there's all kinds of stuff, fasting, intermittent fasting, uh, fasting mimicking, and we want to talk about these, these topics and these questions. And awesome. so, um, you know, Jen, you and I have known each other a while now, and I'm grateful to have you here on the Girlfriend Doctor Show. We've got a lot to discuss today about fasting and also your uh, book that you had published called Cleanish. And I like that it's cleanish because, you know, especially as women, we're like, eh, what's the, what's the rules that I can get around? Right. <laughs> you know, it's not like clean all the time, but clean in what areas we can be clean ish. Right. That's okay too. Um, so, uh, so we want to talk about that. Tell us a bit about your story and how you got into fasting. All right. Well, um, you know, I was just trying to think of when we first met and I think it was when you came on the intermittent fasting podcast, was it in 2017? When did your book come out? Um, 2016. It, okay. 2016. Oh, well then I think you came on in 2017 because Melanie and I did not start our, that podcast till 2017. So it must've been your second book that you came on intermittent fasting podcast and talked about, but, um, then I finally oh, got to meet wait, you. Face yeah, to no, so 20, 20, um, 19 was my first published book, the hormone okay. fix. And then All right, 2020 that's was Keto Green 16. Okay. Then 2019 then is when it was. Yep. Yep. Because I remember where I was sitting. I like always remember where I was. Yep. That was, <laughs> it was 2019. All right. Yep. So my story with intermittent fasting, you know, I've got a very different story than, than probably a lot of people out in the space with books and everything and podcasts, because most people out there are doctors or medical professionals. And I am a retired elementary school teacher. So people might say, what, you know, how in the world is an elementary school teacher publishing books about intermittent fasting and having podcasts about intermittent fasting? Well, if we backtrack, I was someone who struggled with weight and, you know, I struggled with weight before I even struggled with weight. And I think a lot of people can probably relate to that. I was raised by a dance teacher mother who was hyper-focused on, you know, how she looked in her tights and leotard, you know, there in the dance class. And so I learned to hyper-focus on my body as well. And even when I was slim and a teenager and didn't have a weight problem, I was really thinking about, well, I'm going to need to diet. What is it going to be? Um, of course, started with calorie counting, like so many of us did all the diets as I got older over the years from low fat to low carb to whatever was the diet of the day. But over the decades, I went from someone who had no weight problem, but just was very interested in dieting to someone who hmm, my yo-yos were a little bit in the overweight range all of a sudden, then I would get back down. Then they were going up higher in the overweight range until eventually I ended up obese in 2014. Um, that's when I really hit, hit the rock bottom of, of when, when it came to my weight, we went on a family cruise and I had been through a period of time where I was trying to be an intuitive eater, which really resonated with me. You know, we can learn to tune into our hunger and satiety signals. We can be intuitive eaters. The weight will just fall off. You don't even need to weigh, eat what sounds good. I was doing all that was not working for me at all. Got back from the cruise, got on. I felt terrible on the cruise. I saw pictures uh, from like formal night and I was like, who is that? 
you know, I felt like, like someone had just inflated me with like a balloon, right? That's how my whole body felt like everything was just puffy and inflated. Um, and I got on the scale and I was 210 pounds. So I was officially obese and I don't know how long I had been over 200 because it had been a while since I'd weighed, but that was that number that I vowed to never go across. You know, I will never be over 200 no matter what I do. Right. And there I was. Um, so at that time I was like, all right, well, I've got to do something. I can't just keep ignoring this. And eventually I found my way back to intermittent fasting. You might say, what do you mean back to it? Well, I had first heard of it in about 2009, because again, I was a diet connoisseur. I was reading everything there was about how anyone was losing weight. And so I had dabbled in a few of the early plans, Dr. Burt Hearing's Fast Five, Brad Pilon, Eat, Stop, Eat, um, Krista Veraday's Every Other Day Diet. There was another one, Dr. Johnson had an alternate daily fasting book out, um, Anything that was written about fasting, I had at the, that point, I had read it and I had dabbled in it, but I didn't understand because no one really was writing about or, or even, I don't know if they understood it and just weren't talking about it, the metabolic adaptations that our bodies have to go through for us to become successful intermittent fasters. So the very worst thing you can do is dabble in it because you'll never get adapted. Mm -hmm. So there in 2014, I was suddenly desperate enough to say, I am not going to quit. So that's the, that was the big difference. That time I didn't quit. Um, I, I did intermittent fasting. I stuck with it. I was also, you know, finally able to see some results. I was weighing daily and calculating a weekly average. And I did it old school. I wrote it on paper, did the math. That works. And that and works, well, it right? worked because for the first time I saw, like, I would always quit because I didn't see results. Like, cause you know, we fluctuate a great deal, especially as women and my weight would be so up and down that I never could tell that I was losing weight, but suddenly I could see that I was losing weight because my weekly average was going down week by week. So that also helped me not quit. And so to make a long story short, I went on to lose 75 pounds and get to my original goal weight in 2015, went on to lose about five pounds more over time. But I, I continued to be interested in intermittent fasting. And again, I was an elementary teacher at the time. So I started a small Facebook support group designed to be there for me and my friends, people that I knew because they wanted to know, you know, suddenly Jen was, you know, this crazy thing Jen was doing not only did it work, but Jen was keeping the weight off, which they'd never seen me do before. So I had a lot of people who wanted to know what to do. So we started in the Facebook groups, which led to eventually hundreds of thousands of Facebook group members. And um, I wrote a self-published book about intermittent fasting that did really, really, really well. And then I wrote a traditionally published book about intermittent fasting, had a couple podcasts, um, my favorite is intermittent fasting stories. You've been on that one with me. It's where I talk to people who live an intermittent fasting lifestyle. And so, you know, here I am, I'm a teacher writing books about intermittent fasting, doing podcasts about intermittent fasting, but really I still consider myself to be a teacher. And now I'm just teaching about intermittent fasting because that's what teachers do. You know, we don't have to be the, you know, I'm not a historian, but I can teach history. I'm not a mathematician, but I can teach math. I'm not a doctor or medical professional, but I can learn the information, do the research, and then bring it to you. We're we're just, we're basically we're taught to redeliver content, and so that's really how I see myself. I'm I'm here redelivering content, just in a different way and um, in a different classroom. No, I, I love that, and you're such a good teacher, and you've been able to communicate what you're teaching really, really well, and also your story, living it by. Um, you know, in person. And, you know, you say over 200 pounds. I'm like, how tall are you? Because I know we've hung out together and I'm like, I can't even imagine you over 200 pounds. I know I'm five, 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 and I'm, I'm five, eight, and I've been well over 240 pounds. And so mm -hmm. with hair loss, with, you know, chronic crashing fatigue and I really understand. And I think we're, we're starting to get awareness. We want people into the intermittent fasting lifestyle since I really, you know, I started in functional medicine and working with three day cleanse fast after mm -hmm. a modified elimination and detoxification diet in early 2000s. But then in my own journey, where in 2015, 2014, 2015, I was gaining weight again, after mm -hmm. having lost 80 pounds and kept it off gaining weight again, and um, having all those perimenopausal symptoms, the brain fog, the hot flashes, the mood swings, the, 
you know, anxiety, the depression, the difficulty sleeping, which I'm a terrible sleeper. I've always been a notoriously uh, short sleeper and I'm an obstetrician and it was in school oh, yeah. practice for many years. So it just suited me to go into that lifestyle, I think. And so even worse, right? Waking up in the middle of the night, not being able to get back to sleep and, and things like that and not feeling rested during the day. And so those were flaring symptoms. And that took me into what I call my keto green approach. And, and we've talked about this on your show with Melanie, and it is really life saving for me. And it includes intermittent fasting as you know, as a part of the lifestyle, at least 13 to 16 hours between dinner and breakfast, and then adding in some prolonged fast like that 72 hour fast, or if we can do it even longer, occasionally, I've done as long as a five day uh, over a five day uh, water fast and what the different types of fasting that we can mm -hmm. do. But there is an issue as we're moving into this lifestyle. And as I see it in, in the community since 2015, since bringing it online, is that we hit, sometimes we hit plateaus and we have to watch how much we're fasting as women. And women have to do things differently at, you know, than men. And especially when we hit the perimenopausal menopausal age range. So 35, to 60 is there's a transition period that's occurring. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, we have to keep focusing on that metabolic flexibility. And so right. one of the things I've loved about your platform is fast, feast, fast, and um, hitting some of those roadblocks when we fasted too long. Mm -hmm. That's really important. And, you know, there's a, a chapter in fast feast repeat that's called tweak it till it's easy. And that word easy is, is really, really key because we've been raised up all, you know, Nike, think of what Nike told us, just do it right. We, we were always taught no pain, no gain. If you were going to do something and it was going to be worthwhile, it was going to hurt and you were going to suffer, right? Oh that's, yeah, just do that's, it. Do it. That's what we've been taught. And, you know, so a lot of women have that so ingrained that we also think that intermittent fasting needs to be like that. Like, well, if you're, if you're not feeling miserable, then you're not doing it right. And I would like to say it's actually the opposite. If you are feeling miserable, you're not doing it right exactly. now. The one thing I want to say is not during the adaptation period, because when your body is learning to be metabolically flexible, it's going to that that's where you have to kind of push through some of the, the harder feelings is because your body is not fat adapted when you begin. And so your body doesn't know how to tap into your fat stores for fuel. If you've been a sugar burner for probably decades of your life, if not your whole life, you know, you've been waking up, eating breakfast and eating snacks all day, drinking lattes all the time, your body's going to pitch a little fit at first, the first day that you decide like you're going to skip breakfast or something, your body's like, wait a minute, what, what's happening? Send something down. So you have to actually give your body time to adapt. I have something in fast feast repeat called the 28 day fast start. And, um, oh, it's actually kind of funny when, um, when I was writing the book and going through the, the publishing process, my, um, publisher said, all right, we're, we're getting ahead of this what should we tell people to expect during those first 28 days, how much weight they're going to lose? And I said, zero pounds, and they might even gain weight. She was like, oh, we can't say that. Like, well, it's true though. You know, we, we first have to adapt. It's not a quick weight loss method. Um, you, you let your body get fat adapted. And then once you're fat adapted, that's when you tweak it till it's easy. And, you know, I talk about something like, in fast feast repeat, I call it the fasting Olympics. We are not doing the fasting Olympics where you have to just fast more and more and more. It's all about really learning to listen to your body and what rhythm feels good. You know, most of the time when we do a diet, you know, I don't consider fasting to be a diet, by the way, because fasting is not what you eat. Fasting is when you eat. But when you've done diets in the past, you know how the longer you do it, the harder it gets. And, and you start to feel worse and worse until one day you're like rummaging around the cupboard and you're eating like leftover fried onions that you had on a casserole at Thanksgiving because that's the only thing in there, right? <laughs> and so that's how most diets end. But with fasting, it actually does get easier and easier over time. And you start getting into that rhythm. You learn what feels good. You learn what eating window works for you. That is not universal. Some people do better with a 16-8. You're, you're pretty much 16-8, right? 
Yeah, pretty much 16. Sometimes, again, I want to keep that flexibility. I want to keep my body challenged. I don't want, you know, to get into that stall. So I do change things up. So 13 to 16, sometimes Sundays are my one meal a day, typically, right, you know, and a one meal a day, healthy feasted meal, like, Mm -hmm. you know, like all bets, almost all bets, still gluten free, dairy free, low, low sugar, all of that stuff. No, no bad, no junk. But, I tend um, to be 19.5 most days. That That's what feels great for me. You know, some days if my body's a little hungrier, I'll I'll have a longer eating window that day, but I feel really so good around. When you talk mm-hmm. about that 19.5, what's the yeah. time around that? And what are you doing during those five hours? It, it's different from day to day. So I've been living this lifestyle consistently since 2014 and I no longer officially time my window. I just live my life, open my window when it feels right, eat within it in a way that feels right. And then I don't actually officially close it. I just, you know, like not, not eating anymore because I've had enough. I'm satisfied. So I've gotten really great at listening to my body and knowing when I need to eat a little more or when I've had enough. And so I tend to be somewhat, and I like, I like, I'm a volume eater. So I like to eat when I eat, I really like to eat. So I'll start with a hearty snack and then a few hours later I'll have dinner and then I'll close my window with a little something just because you know, that, that I need like maybe a little bite of something sweet, maybe a date or something like that. I love to have dates to close my window and then bacon wrap dates. Those oh, are yes. I'm just so lazy. I don't want to take the time to do so. I'm just I'm like grabbing them out. I have a few out of the bag. They're like candy. <laughs> But yes, bacon wrap dates are so good. You're exactly right. But it's just very, very intuitive to me now. Um, there's a book. Is his name Will Cole that wrote Intuitive Fasting? Is that his I name? If that's, I don't know if Will Cole. I'm not Will, sure it's Will, Will something. On that one, but it's Will something. Check. Yeah. There's a book called Intuitive Fasting. And um, I love that title. So sadly. When that book came out, the intuitive eating community really got upset because they, (laughs) they, they felt like fasting was the opposite of intuitive eating. And, you know, I talked about how I could never be an intuitive eater in the past, but now I really feel like, is it Will Will Cole? Cole. Okay. Uh, Will Cole, Dr. Will Cole, intuitive fasting, the flexible four week intermittent fasting plan. Yeah. And I I have not read that book. So (laughs) I've just been going by the title of it. Um, but I love the title and the idea of being an, an intuitive faster, but as I was saying, the intermittent fasting, I mean, the, um, the intuitive eating community did not like that book because they didn't even read it. They just didn't like the idea that someone was going to be eating, you know, fasting and also eating intuitively, but I really consider myself to be an intuitive faster. Well, um, I think this is where we get to at some point, right? We get to some point after doing this for a while that we start listening to our body's mm-hmm. true signals. Yeah. Like we get out of the phase where we are listening, where we're being run by out of control hormones. So leptin or mm-hmm. ghrelin ghrelin or hunger hormone. And I think that's one of the biggest thing in, in tre- teaching people to go from, you know, their, their misguided, um, instructed three meals to three and three snacks a day or small meals throughout the day type of lifestyle, honestly, because that's creating insulin resistance. And we know oh, yeah. that, um, to, to this, you know, it, you know, intermittent fasting with, for us in our community, keto green lifestyle with maybe it's two meals a day, you know, one to three meals a day and, and changing that up during the week. I mean, there, we have to address that ghrelin hormone, that hunger hormone that has been conditioned like a begging dog to get fed on a regular basis. So if you think about it that way, and I think I, I found it really helpful. Am I, am I, you know, am I giving into my begging dog or am I right. trying to train this dog or, or, you know, or the crying baby or the, way I like to think of it as the inner toddler that wants it now. Yes. The inner toddler that wants it now, or the teenager, mm-hmm. as I have all, all of the above in my house right now, <laughs> <laughs> teenager, dog, baby, we've got it all. So, you know, these are analogies that really work for me. So what is it that works? And that is true about our hormones. So when we get into the lifestyle, we're not driven by a uh, feisty, you know, glucose hunger, then we're Mm -hmm. free. We have that willpower to freedom to be an intuitive eater. 
You have the it, freedom it, now to be true. an intuitive eater. And, and what's funny is eating all the time. I had no connection with my hunger and satiety signals. I mean, I believe all the people in the intuitive eating community who say that they hear those signals and they stop when, but I was completely disconnected from them and just saying, I want to hear them didn't bring it back. You know, I'm pretty sure it was because I had leptin resistance. I'm pretty sure I was insulin resistant. I had a really big belly when I was 210 pounds. I couldn't paint my toenails. You know? So I, I don't really know what my A1C is. I'm sure none of it was good at that time. I was in denial in so many ways. But when with intermittent fasting, I now can hear when I've had enough. And, and I know. And, and, you know, I don't count calories. I don't count macros. I don't shoot for targets. I just, you know, one day I might eat vegetarian that day because I'm not feeling it on the meat. But then another day I'm like, oh, I really would like to have some red meat today. And my body just really lets me know. So, so you've come a long way to get that, right? It is oh, a yeah. process. I always say mm -hmm. it is a marathon and not a sprint, Jen. And yeah. now I'm working in your community. What are the most common things that people, you know, are like struggle with in this concept of intermittent fasting or fasting in general? What have well, you seen? It, it depends on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to like a lay person on the street or like, for example, someone at water aerobics this morning, in fact, in the pool, you know, I'm in, in, at water aerobics, and we're doing our exercising and and one of the members, the actually the person who was teaching the class was like, I've started fasting, which is very exciting. because I love to spread it wherever I go. But then someone else is listening and they're like, oh, I could never do that. I get too hungry. My blood sugar crashes. And so I have to explain that um, that's probably true right now where you are right now, metabolically, you're on that blood sugar roller coaster all the time. You're feeding it, you know, it crashes, you feed it, it shoots back up then it crashes, then you feed it again. So it's like that roller coaster that never ends. But once you're fat adapted, your body can tap into your fat stores for fuel. You actually will not have that happen. So many people who, you know, said, well, I used to have hypoglycemia and now I don't. It's like, well, because now you're metabolically healthy and, and that doesn't happen overnight. So if I'm talking to someone who's just a lay person who thinks they can't do it, then that that's the often the conversation that'll come up. Now in the community, when people have like, let's say they've read Fast Feast or Pete, or maybe they haven't, they've just listened to a few podcasts and they're just starting out and they're coming into my community. The big thing we have to really talk to beginner fasters about is you are not going to lose a lot of weight really fast and don't even fret about that. You know, in, in Fast Feast or Pete, I tell them not to expect weight loss for the first 28 days. And in fact, I instruct them not to weigh. Way on day zero before you start, put the scale away for the next 28 days. You're allowed to get on it on day 29. But if it says you've gained two pounds, that is also okay because day 29 is your baseline. You're going to go from there and weigh daily, calculate your weekly average, expect to see slow and steady weight loss from that point forward. But then there's people, I guess they didn't believe me. They thought I was kidding. <laughs> They're like, it's day 14. I got on the scale and I haven't lost any weight. And now I'm so upset. I'm like, no, don't be upset. Your body is learning to do something new. Well, don't you think that sometimes it's because they're still, they're working on intermittent fasting, right? Gradually yeah. you're working them through that, but then they're still eating their food sensitivities. Well, and that's that true. You really have to, you really have to like, that's where the investigative work comes in. And I always yeah. say, put your Nancy Drew hat on, right? Yep. We've got to figure out what it is for us. And then Jen, sometimes like in fasting for a while, and this is something that I ran into when I went carnivore, you know, I wanted to try the different plans and then, you know, creating what happens, like what, what's the next thing? What else can I do? What's the you know, a better biohack. And I gained weight on being carnivore. So I was already keto adapted. So it wasn't right. new to me to get into ketosis because I'd been intermittent fasting and in my keto green lifestyle for years at that point. So this was just when I first moved to Texas. And yeah, it could be some of the, you know, Texan carnivore, maybe, yep. you know, it was a water burger without the bun at one point, but, you know, uh, you know, driving, hauling horses and, and crazy lifestyle stuff and a lot of stress. And the first place mm -hmm. we rented, there was mold toxins. Oh gosh. For sure. So we are two months in a, in a very moldy um, Airbnb. And so there were other, there are definitely other um, confounding factors, as we like to say in medicine. So other confounding variables. And so, but yet 
it was that interesting point where here now carnivore also with intermittent fasting, but gaining weight and looking at my metabolism. And I interviewed uh, Dr. David Perlmutter, one of my favorite humans on earth on his book, uh, drop acid, Mm -hmm. which talked about uric acid. And certainly during my carnivore plan, because I would do hot yoga every morning, I started feeling like left big toe pain. Oh, so interesting. And that's, it, gout. That is and that's a gout that yeah. means yeah. elevated uric acid, which falls in line with my, you know, genetics and my, right. you know, my metabolic genetics or genetics of my metabolism and being Middle Eastern and um, Mediterranean that, 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 what uric acid is a survival um, mm-hmm. a substrate that comes in to slow down your metabolism. And so I think that is real. So dropping acid, dropping your uric acid levels, monitoring for that and keeping that. Sadly, I didn't check my uric acid at the time, but I knew that carnivore long-term was not the right step for me. Mm-hmm. And certainly not in that environment. Now I do spring it in every once in a while, maybe one day to six days, because six days, mm-hmm. that's my menu pause plans are six days. But it is, um, you know, it's in court changing that in, but also changing in when you need to establish, you know, feeding your gut microbiota, that's right. with the plant-based plans and how important that is to listen to. But sometimes we get into the state that even with our fasting, we're either not losing weight or gaining mm-hmm. more weight. And so you've got millions of people in your community. So I know you've seen this come up. What have right. you, how have you addressed it? Well, that's a great question. And we really are all so different. You just really, you talked about it there, the idea of bio-individuality and the foods that work for us are not the same. And we definitely have, you know, a, a biological component with our DNA that factors into some of it. Like for example, dairy, um, you know, I don't know if this is going to be controversial, but I do not believe that hundred percent of all people should not have dairy. I am of the genetic good. Okay. Just make sure. <laughs> I am of the, don't include it because I can't have it. And so I'm not going to put it in my recipes. (laughs) I, I, that makes total sense. That makes total sense. But I, based on my DNA analysis, I am one of those people that is lactase persistent, which means somewhere down the line, my ancestors developed the ability to continue to produce lactase after infancy and can still digest dairy. So it's only 25% of the world population for, I I think are lactase persistent. And so it's all a matter of figuring out what works for you and knowing that we're all different. That genetic component is part of it. Also our gut microbiome health is so important as, as far as when it comes to what foods work for us. Are you familiar with the, um, the, um, the predict studies and Zoe, the, the Zoe group there, they're, um, Tim Spector, he wrote the foreword for my book, cleanish. He works with a lot of, he's not the only one doing it, but they're basically working on personalized nutrition where they test what's in your gut microbiome. You were a CGM. They look at your blood glucose response. They look at how well your body clears fats. They give you these special muffins you eat. Basically they use all this data about you and come up with an algorithm and give you like, here is you know, some, some scores for foods and what will work for you. Like I learned, I don't clear blood fat. Well, my body doesn't clear fat well. And so if I eat too much fat, it's inflammatory for me. Well, that makes sense. Whenever I ate too much fat, right. when I tried keto, I got so puffy. I, I felt very inflamed and I can eat fat, high quality fat. I just shouldn't eat quite as much of it as someone who clears fat easily. In the, someone who clears fat easily is not going to have the problem. Whereas if you clear it slowly, it's inflammatory for you. So it's just fascinating to learn. You can really listen. I mean, I knew that I didn't feel great eating that way. And now I have some science as to why. And so my mission in life is to equip people to learn to listen to their bodies. I already knew that about myself without having this testing done. The testing just confirmed it. I'm like, well, I'm not surprised, but we really can feel people who have trouble with dairy probably know it. If they have trouble with gluten, they probably know it. Yes. <laughs> and if, if they've ever investigated it at all, they, they can tell they feel better when they leave it out. We have a lot of power in our bodies to steer us in the direction of what works well for us and what doesn't. And, and when I think intermittent fasting helps us tune into it. You know, it's, it's not surprising at all for someone to do it for a while. And they'll say, suddenly food X, Y, Z. I can't eat it anymore. I'm intolerant to it. I'm like, you probably always were, 
but you just couldn't tell because you were in that constant state of you know, inflammatory state of all the time. And now you're fasting. You feel so good during the fast. You really can feel the difference when you eat that food. And so fasting really helps us tune into all of that. Yeah, no, I agree. And I always tell clients, if it's a food that if I said, I'm going to take it away from you, you would like cry big and scream to keep that in your diet. And I see it all the time. Yeah. Could be your chocolate could be your coffee, yeah. could be your anything, but whatever it is, it's a good idea to stop it for at least seven days, mm -hmm. if not 21 days and just see how do you do without it? And then what happens when you reintroduce it? So yep. I think that's the the part of awareness. And so I want to ask, um, what do you do? What is a day in the life of Jen Stevens, fasting expert, author, oh. cleanish, you know, <laughs> what does she do? Like with eating and everything? Yeah. Yeah. What's a okay. day in your life? Well, it's just so very different. Actually, I mean, it's, it's fairly consistent, I guess, although my, my eating window can vary dramatically from day to day, but I'm, I'm an afternoon, usually eating window person. So I wake up in the morning and make my coffee every day, have my black coffee and um, feed the cats. And then I spend some time in my community, which I love to do when I would see what went on overnight, um, catch up on that, play a little wordle. And then I go to water aerobics, all in the fasted state, you know, keep my mind strong, loving water aerobics, keep my body strong, come home from that. And then I just, I work any of the work that I need to do, whether I'm podcasting or writing something or anything like that, I do all of that in the, in the fasted state. And then there comes a time in the early to late afternoon where I'll open my eating window and you know, what I have might vary, um, it could be something really heavy with like, a, like lentils, beans, vegetables. I love daily harvest. I don't know if you've ever had daily harvest. They have these bowls that are full of so much vegetable goodness. And I'll of course add some butter in there because I need a little, they're, I think they're vegan, but I'm, I'm not vegan. So I add the butter in there and sometimes a little heavy cream and some salt and some pepper to make it a little more delicious. And then, um, you know, if I need another little something, I'll have it. And then later I prepare dinner for the family. I usually cook every night and we sit down and eat together and might have a little something sweet to close my window. And, you know, maybe my eating window was four hours. Maybe it was seven hours. Maybe it was five, maybe it was six. It just really depends on the day. But, you know, I like to think about our bodies. You know, we don't count calories, but we count nutrients. And so my body pretty much lets me know you know, when I feel well nourished, I can tell, you know, we had, um, a couple of days I use green chef. Have you ever used green chef? I love green chef. No, not um, yet, but I've it's heard organic. Green. It's really great. Well, something terrible happened to my box this weekend. It was supposed to come on Saturday. We're recording this on Wednesday. It actually showed up this morning and I threw it straight into the trash because it was supposed to be on Saturday. So it went, it went, it was almost here. They didn't put it on truck and ended up in Kennesaw, Georgia. Then it went to Spartanburg, South Carolina. Then it came finally to here today, but we didn't have any food. So we ate out for two nights, just out of the blue. I, I was like, we don't have any food. I don't know what to do. Where do you live, Jen? Where's home? Well, we just moved to the coast of South Carolina. Oh, I love it. I love it. Cause yeah. you know, I was on the coast of Georgia for 22 years. I love it here. I'm so happy. We have a house right on the beach, a little cottage. Um, and I, I love being here, but we went out to eat and, you know, trying to find things that are not inflammatory <laughs> at a restaurant. Right. So then the next, after two nights of that, I was like, I just need vegetables. <laughs> so my body let me know I had not given it enough nutrients in the past two days before. And literally all I wanted was like, I wanted lima beans. I wanted some corn. I wanted some tomatoes. I wanted salad. So I just loaded up on all the, all those different things. And it was just a whole vegetable day. Yeah, no, I love that. I love the integrating all day vegetarian days too. And I think that again, that flexibility, giving your body time to rest and, and digest. And that's another issue too. And that's where fasting really helps because our current lifestyle and the you know, our current lifestyle is, has been, you know, as we grew up, kids are learning right now, as I dropped my daughter off at school this morning, they're already back oh. in school here and, um, that they're going to eat, you know, they have snack time or they used to have mm -hmm. snack time. And, and so, and she's been very much part of my intermittent fasting lifestyle. 
And uh, so there's no snacking, really. We don't right. have snack. We don't have that language in our house anymore. And and so it'd be in, it's interesting for her. And, and she's looking at the school lunches. She goes, Mom, I don't think there'll be anything I can eat there. And what grade and is she in? She's in ninth grade now. Okay. She's yeah. in ninth grade now. Yeah. And so looking at that and seeing, okay, let's see, you know, what choices that she's going to make at this time and how her skin, which is often a quick reactor to things mm -hmm. that she knows she's not supposed to have. So in, in, in my daughter's life, it's definitely dairy. Dairy causes cystic acne in our, in our family tree here. And also um, just in general breakout. So, uh, so that's something. And then of course the sugar and, and, yeah. and carbs doesn't make her feel good. And this is where we really run into run into difficulty and, and students going to school, right? If they're eating a high carb breakfast, they're going to crash. Oh, that's absolutely. The yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. So oh, yeah. that's where bacon and eggs come in. Where, yep. But know, they're not eating bacon and eggs at home. They're not, they're having snack bars and yeah. Yeah. And too many carbs. So like, that's better to have a beef jerky bar or, you yep. know, one of those, you know, the, those as options for our kids as they're running out the door today, I made her turkey and, um, and uh, tomatoes with mayo and and lettuce, but uh, you know, so a quick a quick roll, a quick roll up in a gluten free bread. So some starch there, but not too much. And um, but making sure that I've got the protein and fat on board right. for her as well. So here, as you're going out the door, you're eating this in the car on the way to school, and so type thing. And often we'll do smoothies in the morning for her too, and try to eat earlier and earlier in the evening. So mm -hmm. that's another big shift that we try to make as a family. So these little things can make a difference. And again, never too young, never too old. And it's we want to keep our kids as healthy and, and set up for health. Cause I was a fat kid. I was a fat kid. Yeah. I was obese and I was, you know, heading or borderline obesity in the fifth grade. And, and it just went from there. I was definitely different than the other um, kids in my class. I was in, you know, middle America. Um, well, in Pennsylvania and uh, small town suburbia. And I was, you know, my parents, my mom was an immigrant to the US. And so it was, I was already different, right? Yeah. And so that just added to the difference that I had mm -hmm. felt about myself. It's so fascinating as we look to see where we are today. And right. the biggest thing is that I want our, my audience here to know that fasting is really good for you. And there's no yeah. hard set rules and yep. you will get over the hunger Fat stores toxins, so you have to yeah. detox safely and you have to fast safely. And that's why we really like to alkalinize and check your pH in my community to make sure that's happening. And even that, you know, shot of Mighty Maca during your fasting, during your fasting window to help your body eliminate toxins. It's, in my opinion, so much better than a black cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> because we want to detoxify, then have your black cup of coffee, but detoxify and remove those toxins first in a very holistic, in a holistic way as much as possible. And, and we've, you know, this, one of the things that teasing through doing this for, you know, many years now is that makes a difference is better. And then play, changing things up, right, Jen? Just changing yeah. things up. Okay. You ready for Absolutely. my rapid fire questions, my friend? I am. I am. I feel like I'm like on a game show. I Should know, I? Right. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> what is with all these things? What is your favorite food? If you were just say, okay, this is oh, like potatoes, I eat this. potatoes. Oh, I love, God. I love a baked potato with butter and sour cream. And you know, some people crash after eating, not me. I am full satisfied. I also loaded up, like I said, with butter and sour cream that keeps it from hitting my bloodstream in a bad way, but I just feel great. Oh my gosh, you're just reminding me truffle fries. I was in oh. uh, Italy and we did a truffle hunt in the morning oh. of my birthday. So with the dogs go out and they dig up these truffles and they give them back to the truffle hunters, actually called truffle hunters. And let me tell you, these two men were the happiest men I have oh. ever seen. They were so happy. So I'm looking up on, I'm, I'm, you know, Googling what's in truffles and they are anandamides, right? So that is like- okay. That is the feel good hormones, right? The wow. Good hormones. And it's just, they're loaded in that and they're anti-inflammatory and medicinal, but they're loaded in this anandamide. So they, it, you know, increase your body. I love that. See? Of this happy hormone. You, you got to look at my Instagram for some of those pictures of those. Okay. Hunters. They are happy men. They are happy. Well, men. now we know why it makes sense. Um, 
I I don't know. Also being out in nature, right? Yeah. Getting by the dogs, G, oxytocin, yeah. dogs. There's yeah. a lot of oxytocin in this activity, and, and they radiated that. So it was super fun to see that. And um and so yeah, so we talked about food now. Um, so that goes into my pillar of nourish. The second yeah. pillar is shine. You are gorgeous. Do you have oh, a favorite you. skincare routine or anything or product that you really I'm love? I'm simple. I use Beauty Counter. Are you familiar with Beauty oh, Counter? Yeah, I love Beauty yeah, Counter. I love Beauty Counter. And when I was writing Cleanish, I realized how greenwashed we are. You know, like we believe that, that certain products are like clean and green and they really are not. And so we have to do a lot of research, but the reason I love beauty counter is because they do all the research and I don't have to fool with it. I can just know if they're selling it. It's good. <laughs> I know and that really yeah. does put peace. One on fewer thing to think about, but I don't really do much. I just, I use, I wash my face in the morning. I don't put on a lot of creams and things. I just don't. And then yeah, I just use their foundation and the, their makeup. And then at night I just wash my face again. And that's really it. Oh, that is so good. I use my, I'm doing everything, girl. I yeah. use my Jolva Kiss on my lips. Uh -huh. I use my balance cream on my neck and uh, my forehead. Now, I do use that. Wrinkles. I do use the balance cream right here. Your balance cream. So when I said I didn't use a bunch of cream, that that was a lie. I do That's use yours. Well, that is yeah. awesome. Good to know. I, <laughs> I do put that on every day. Yeah. Because it's doing more than just, you know, this is where I need the most help. Also. <laughs> Around the neck. I know. Tighten up. I'm like, I want my jawline to maintain as much as exactly. possible. And yeah. uh, not to go without. Okay. So that's our shine. And then awaken. What's What book are you reading now? I'm reading. I can't remember the name of it, but it's about the law of attraction. Oh, so it's, so it's. What, one of the Abraham books. I don't know if you've read any of those. Yeah. Um, Abraham Hicks. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, a friend of mine, Sherry Salata got me hooked a while back and I've been out of it for a while. I'm going to have to dig that in. A coach of mine said, you know, start your day with adding in positive affirmations. Yes. Like oh in, yeah. Start reading more and mm -hmm. Um, doing that. And let your emotions be your guide and always search for a better feeling. That's what I'm taking away from this book right now. You're whatever you're feeling right now, always search for a better feeling emotion. Mm -hmm. And the better feeling emotion might be like, if you're feeling rage, maybe just disappointment is a better feeling emotion. Mm -hmm. You're going up the continuum towards feeling something better. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that will take you where you want to go. I love that. I love that. Thank you. And, um, you've been married, you just celebrated your 31st yes. wedding anniversary. And my fourth pillar, and for me, it's the most important one is embrace. It's about connection. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are ups and downs, good years and bad years in marriages and life in general. What has been your unifying factor? And how do you look at your marriage now versus when you got married? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I look back to that, that, 31 year ago, Jen and, and Chad, we were, we were babies. We met, um, we were 19 and 20 when we met and got together and we got married a year later. So we were 20 and 21 when we got married, we had no idea we're, we're different people now. Everyone, you know, grows and changes. I feel like we've kind of grown up together. And the, the thing about marriage is they, they become your family, you know, in, in a way that, you're closer than even like your blood family, you know, because the, this is the person that's been through literally everything in my adult life with me, you know, the good times, the bad times, we have two sons, you know, we've moved, you know, from state to state together. And even when you're having struggle times, cause you will, you do in any, in any, oh, my cat is crying. I'm sorry if you could hear that in any relationship. Um, when you have those struggle times, they're still your family. And so I always, you know, keep that in mind. There's no one who knows me better and no one that I know better. And, you know, even when you wake up and you're grouchy, you know, and again, I woke up grouchy with him um, about a week ago and I was, I, cause I'd been mad when I went to bed and I woke up mad. And instead of like thinking about why I was mad, I'm like, I'm going to make a list of things I love about Chad. And I did, I made a list about the things that I love about him. And that got me out of the feeling grouchy. I love that, Jen. And I think I heard one time the concept of shared experiences. When it mm -hmm. comes down to anything, you have these shared experiences. And 
And that is really valuable. That is really, I mean, that's one of the most valuable things that we share with someone and to all to be appreciated of those shared experiences, but also that common goal. Like, do you feel like, like you created, you and Chad have a common goal, common vision for the future of, of you two as a couple? And I think that's important. You know, we, we just entered a new season of our life. Um, he just retired. You know, I retired in 2018 from teaching and I've been doing the, the work that I do now in the intermittent fasting world, but he just retired from being a college professor. So now we're like, we're envisioning what, what the next stage of our life looks like. So he retired and we moved from Georgia to South Carolina all in the same month. And he's, wow. he's figuring out what he's going to do. And, you know, we, we don't have any grandchildren yet. Yeah, our kids are 22 and 24. So, you know, we're just seeing where it takes us. So we've got a lot of years ahead of us, especially since we're both intermittent fasters. And yes. so we're going to, yeah, we're going to grow old and be vibrantly healthy together and figure it out. I think right there is a common vision for the future, right? right. A shared goal, grow old, yep. living, you know, happily and thriving together. And he even goes to water aerobics with me sometimes, not every day, but it is hilarious, but he goes, <laughs> he just does, does his own thing. It. He's over there doing whatever. We've got the weights, you know, the weights that you use in the water. He's, we're all doing one thing and he's doing something different. It doesn't even matter. We're having fun. Well, tell our audience where they can find you and your books and your groups. All right. Well, I am at jenstevens.com. Jen is like gin and tonic. Stevens is with a PH. And everything is linked from jenstevens.com. If you want to read more about intermittent fasting, my New York Times bestseller is Fast, Feast, Repeat. And it has everything in there that you need to know. A lot of frequently asked questions. I know all the questions since I ran Facebook groups for so many years. And we've heard all of them. Um, and then my book, Cleanish, Eat Mostly Clean, Live Mainly Clean, and Unlock Your Body's Natural Ability to Self-Clean. That is not an intermittent fasting book. although. One of our self-cleaning strategies is intermittent fasting. Um, and then my community, you can get to it through jenstevens.com slash community. It's a paid community. We were on Facebook for so many years, but it just got so big. I could no longer interact with the group members. I was doing just group maintenance all the time. And I was like, forget that. I want to be in a smaller place where we can connect and I can actually talk to people. And so that's, that's what we're doing at jenstevens.com slash community. Um, if you're interested in intermittent fasting and, and want to hear inspiring stories, my podcast, Intermittent Fasting Stories, comes out twice a week, every Tuesday, every Thursday. And I talk to wonderful intermittent fasters, such as Anna Quebeca, and they tell <laughs> their stories. Anytime. Yeah, well, you, you were there and it, it was a, a really great episode and everyone loved it. Um, because especially because you've got a medical background that my guests, you know, are, are wide ranging, but my audience loves it when a doctor comes on the show and lives an intermittent fasting lifestyle, because, you know, we want to know that smart people like you who know about the body are doing intermittent fasting. And there'll be more and more of us. There'll be more and oh, more yeah. of us as we start to, as, you know, physicians start talking to other physicians and, you know, realize oh, yeah. that we've been going down a wrong journey. So there's more mm -hmm. and more of us coming up, just like women going through menopause, right? Oh, yeah. Or female physicians going through menopause are having their eyes open that what they've been yes. taught and, and prescribing is not exactly doing the best job. So, so um, with that, you know, so grateful that you're ahead of the curve on this fasting and fasting lifestyle and also being, you know, in your early, early fifties, right? Right. That 53. You, yeah. 53 that you are also know about the importance of this as a perimenopausal menopausal hack, oh, yeah. biohack for longevity and how critical mm -hmm. it is for brain health, physical health. Jen, thank you so much for being on the show and being a light in this field, a shining light in this field. And you guys check out Jen Stevens, jenstevens.com on her, uh, for her website, check her out. She's just amazing. Listen thank to her you. podcast. And of course, remember with us in the Girlfriend Doctor community, you can ask or tell me anything. We bring on these shows based on your questions, comments, that and suggestions that are brought up through our customer service at team at drannacabeca.com. Really uh, is fabulous to share this information. So I encourage you to share this episode, share where you heard it, and um, let us know any questions you have. Thank you all. Until next time.